Hello and welcome to the Creative Tech Podcast, where we discuss how technology can help you to be more creative. This podcast is made by the National Centre for Creativity, enabled by AI, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we call it CBE for short. It's presented by the director of CBE, Professor Neil Maiden. Neil, who's in the studio today? Today's podcast guest is someone who is ideally placed to provide new perspectives on how digital technologies can support human creativity. Not only is he a named international expert on human computer interaction who specializes in technology for creative uses, but also he is a pioneer in the field of computer art and an artist in his own right. Today's guest is Professor Ernest Edmonds someone who has been working at the intersection of computing, creativity and the arts since the 1960s. Ernest holds chairs at both the University of Technology Sydney in Australia and at Montford University in the UK. He first used computers in his art practice in 1968 and has subsequently exhibited this artwork from Moscow and LA to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. If that were not enough, He's also founder of the ACM Creativity and Cognition Conference series, the world's leading place for researchers and artists to come together and talk about creativity. Hello, Ernest. How are you? And welcome to our podcast. Hi, Neil. I'm good, thank you. And I'm very pleased to be here to join you in this very interesting enterprise of yours. Thank you. And what have you been up to since the conference? Uh, Well, I've been making new artworks and I've been writing about this art for books and trying to get a little break here and there. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds wise, sounds wise. So we're talking about the conference. This year's ACM Creativity and Cognition Conference took place in June and you gave a keynote at it in which you looked back at how the field of digital creativity has evolved over the last 30 years. What key insights did you take away from that? Well, what I tried to do was remind myself, first of all, and then remind others and tell young people who didn't know how it all came about and try to think about where it went during those years and where it's got to now. It was interesting really remembering that in the 1980s I was going to conferences run by artists using computers and I was going to conferences with computer scientists trying to build AI models of creativity. But the Artists didn't invite computer scientists to their meetings and the AI people were very against inviting artists to their (laughs) meetings. I quote, they don't know anything about it. And I thought this was all wrong. I'm a very, very keen multidisciplinary sort of person and I thought that that the only way forward for creativity was multidisciplinary work. And that's why we created the conference to bring artists, cogsci people, computer scientists and so on together. It still does that. So that's very good. But the good news isn't just that that conference does it, but it's become more normal now. And there are many other conferences that do this today. Uh, And so I find that a very encouraging change that's happened over this time. The way I put it, in the human-computer interaction world, we've really moved from being concerned about ease of use and productivity to enhancing human creativity. And so that is the drift that I've seen. And I tried to reflect on what I saw in this year's conference and the last one and to reflect on where I thought we were going next. Do you think we're going in the right direction as a, as a community as a whole? I think the community I saw at that conference was pretty encouraging. But if I look more generally, <clears throat> I feel that the wider community is still a bit heavily hooked on machine learning at the moment, as if that's Mm -hmm. got to solve all the world's problems, whereas it really is bringing as many problems as it's (laughs) solving. I guess it's a passing fad, but it doesn't feel like it just at this time. I think the tyranny of big data is with us for a while. So what do you think think we need more of? What we need is a bit more emphasis on what I might just call coding. I mean, I think we want more hands-on use of the medium. I think we want people to be not just 
playing with clever apps that they don't understand. I think we need better mechanisms for people to get deep into what's going on and to manipulate it to their own advantage. Sounds like end-user development of, of creative apps. Is that a, a summary of what you're talking about? Yes. I mean, quite a long time ago, there used to be a branch of HCI called end-user programming. Mm. It came and went, but it was important. <laughs> it was maybe a bit insulting in a way to the, the, the name, but it had the right emphasis that we wanted to give control of all of this to everyone. And if that meant devising different languages, well, fine, or different systems. And mm -hmm. many of those different languages and systems have been devised. Uh, many a school child can write Scratch, for example, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I was thinking uh, of languages like that. There's a lovely vision that you're talking about here that everyone should be able to produce uh, in some way apps or systems that they can be creative with in different ways. Is this still a vision that we should hold as a, as a community? Mm -hmm. It is a vision that we should hold. I mean, we did some deep studies quite often, but I'm particularly thinking of the ones we did in the 1990s, mm -hmm. where we ran a series of artists in residence programs funded by the EPSRC, I might say, which was very good. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and we had a number of conclusions, but one of the conclusions I summarize as artists are awkward people. And what I meant by that was that every creative person working with us always wanted something different to what they were given. Mm -hmm. You could give them a program, you could give them an app, but it never did exactly what they wanted. So it always had to be changed. And the mm -hmm. changing of it was a very important element of the creative process. Mm -hmm. So it isn't necessarily that people need to be able to do things from scratch, but they need to be able to get into the nitty gritty and change what things do to mm -hmm. match their own creative inspiration and intentions. Yeah, there's, just, there's something interesting there about the personalization you see of mobile apps. So everyone has a very personalized device and it's the ability to, to personalize not only to your character, but to your your needs, yes. your, 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 your preferences. Exactly. And, you, and we have to also be careful that underlying these processes, there are often styles built in that people don't realize they're, they're hung on. Mm maybe that isn't the style that they really wanted at all, but they, they just get it given to them. Exactly, exactly. It's the problem of asking for something without really knowing what's possible or what you want. Mm -hmm. Go back to your keynote. You said something that fascinated me. You said that we need to explore the extremes of creative and non-creative work in order to advance our field. I never had a chance to ask you what you meant by that. I now do. What did you mean okay. by that, Ernest? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, well... Um, it's really standard science stuff, actually, that mm -hmm. the boundary conditions are the mm -hmm. places where you learn most. Um, for example, in the psychology of vision, think of Richard Gregory uh, looking at illusions, right? When, when, if you like, the sight process goes wrong, mm. that tells you more about the perception mechanisms than mm -hmm. when it goes right. The boundary conditions in our area are really when people are pushing the limits of creative process. Mm -hmm. So if you just look at being people being creative about choosing their holiday, which is something which is very interesting and is nice to support mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to learn much about the creative process from studying something like that. Whereas if you look at someone in an advanced science lab or an artist pushing the boundaries of their medium, then they get into much more difficulty and you can see, I think, more easily what the problems are and what the opportunities are for supporting people in moving forward. So do you think we could, you know, by understanding how complex interdisciplinary research is happening in the lab, um, in the creative processes, you think that could be used, that the learnings from that could be used to inform creative acts for choosing more innovative holidays? Yes, exactly. Yes. So it's my view that we could learn that the creative process is much the same in mm. all of these things. And that okay. if we can learn these extreme cases, we learn lessons which can be applied in everyday life. Are there any phenomena that you're interested in in the creative process? You know, if someone was to waltz up and offer you a, a million dollar grant tomorrow to do something interesting, to look at an aspect of the creative process, where would you be looking? Well, 
there are two things there. If I want to look at the creative process, I would want to engage the creative people in reflection about their processes. So following Donald Schoen, and I talked in my keynote that you referred to about the work that Linda Candy did in that recent mm -hmm. book on that, where we are learning from the coalface, if you like, from the inside of the creative process. I think we've done a lot of looking at the creative process from the outside, seeing how people were brought up, watching them do things and so on and so forth. And we can learn a certain amount like that. But there's so much more that we can learn by this different methods that are implied by reflective practice coming out of Donald okay. Schoen's work. And I would want to put a heavy program in there where the creative practitioners were played a central part in the research itself and were not just mm. subjects of the research. That makes a lot of sense. Well, if there are any moneyed listeners to this podcast interested in helping Ernest and others undertake their research, um, his contact details will be at the end of this recording. Moving on to another aspect of your life as, as a working artist, you're still an artist generating and exhibiting computer art. In your experience, have the public's attitude to such art evolved over the last 50 years? Yes, it has, quite dramatically, I think. Um, and I separate the public from the formal art world. But mm, let's just talk mm. about the public, as that was your sure. question. When we first had, for example, computers in exhibitions, which were meant to be interacted with, and I'm going back to the late 60s and in the 70s with teletypes and so on, people were afraid to touch them. It was, a, it was a very kind of like distant thing. But that whole attitude to technology has changed because of the familiarity of the technology, I guess, largely. The striking moment when I really understood that things had changed was in Sydney in 2013. We had the ICEA conference there, but also there was what's called the Vivid Festival. It happens mm -hmm. uh, regularly in Sydney, where artworks in particular interactive artworks are placed all around the harbor in the street and so mm. on and at the opening of vivid 2013 there were a lot of interactive artworks around the center of sydney and around circular quay where the ferries come in and out it was chaos you couldn't get on the ferries they were all completely full it was more crowded than New Year's Eve, and I can assure you New Year's Eve in Sydney is very crowded. <laughs> it was chaos because people were so involved and so interested in all this interactive art. The Australia Council people who were responsible for art and funding were really quite taken aback. And mm. I heard speeches from senior figures saying, we've got to rethink what we're doing here because mm. just look... <laughs> at this. People go into the art galleries, it doesn't compare in any way to this. So that was a, an obvious point where we saw that the public had completely shifted its view mm. of this. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the art establishment is still behind the public in this respect. So do you think interactivity is a key uh, characteristic of successful computer art? It's, it's, a, it's almost a differentiator to a lot of the other forms of art we see in more traditional galleries and museums. Is, is that a fair assumption? Interactivity is very important because one of the things that the computer brought into art was the ability to handle this other aspect, interaction, mm. which people were doing in all kinds of ways before this. So instead of just colour and time for film and so on, you now had interaction, something else to mm -hmm. handle. So it's very important in that respect. But that doesn't mean that digital art and the use of computers in art can only deal with interactivity. I think mm -hmm, there are mm -hmm. many important things they do that, to do with static images, for example, okay. or fixed film as well. But interaction is something that's been added to the palette, uh, if you yeah. like. Do you think it's fundamentally changing the way in which people are seeing art? It's almost imposing demands on more traditional forms of art. You, you alluded to this when you talked about the, the Sydney uh, experience. Yes. Yes, I gave a paper with the late Stroud Cornock in 1970 at the Computer Graphics Conference that was held at Brunel University. And we, and this was before PCs and whatnot, so mm -hmm. it was a bit um, difficult. But we argued that interaction would be the big thing for the future mm. 
of art. And the reason was, that was at a time, if you think back to the 60s, uh, which uh, was when we were working up towards this paper, it was all about happenings involving <laughs> the public in mm. making art, in being part of the artwork and so on. So there was a big trend in art to try to, as it were, hand some of the creativity over to the audience. Mm. So the audience mm. became participants. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, as it were, along came computers. And hey, here's a way we can really do this. Mm. So it, it kind of fed a need that was already clearly identified in the art world. So we're on a point in a trajectory here at the moment with, with increased interactivity with art do you see that trajectory flattening off or is it uh, going to go in a, a more exponential growth direction where we're going to see more and more interactive art we're going to see more and more interactive art because the thing that's adding to it at the moment is distribution <laughs> the artwork that i'm working on at this very moment has two parts to it that interact with one another one part will be in leicester in england the other part will be in dubai and the dubai expo mm. and that's one work right mm -hmm. And it could, of course, and I've done other works, uh, as other people have, where, with multiple nodes. And you can have mm. works on phones, so you could have 100 people interacting with the one work, all in different mm. countries, for example. The notion of interaction, instead of just being with one person and one device, becomes a network. There's also the notion that we have, so far, concentrated on action response artwork so you do something and it does mm. something back but sure. real interaction like between people for example is much more long based so i play with the grandchild and i hope that that grandchild will be different in 10 years time because of the play process that we've had mm -hmm. and so on and that is a notion that is increasingly finding a place in art and in interactive art. So there's a long way to go yet. So there's the themes of, of play, which I thought about when you were talking about this earlier, so the way that I playfully engage sometimes with, with interactive exhibits. And also there's almost a, a distributed ownership of art now. If it's on my mobile phone, it's no longer belonging solely to the artists. So I'm That's contributing right. to it and these are shifting sands. And that is very important to many artists. And as I say, had its roots really in that work, in the happenings and whatnot in the 60s. So do you see more traditional artists engaging more with, with computer-based art in the future? Very much so. And I think about music, digital technology is all over the place in it. Mm. Even at the lowest level of like recording. <laughs> so just, <laughs> just distribute the music. It has to use all this technology and so on to do it but increasingly also in the generation of music. The visual arts seem to have driven along a little bit behind music in this take up, but mm. you can see the same path going ahead. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that all art needs to become digital. That would be nonsense, of course, but of course. M more and more of it will be, and it will become more and more normal. Maybe art education needs to take this into account a little bit more heavily to help it along mm. its way. That's an interesting point to maybe close this part of the podcast on that we gen, you know, the general view of society and certainly our society is, is that art is not computer art. It's still a painting hanging on a wall or it's a bronze sculpture in a, in, in a gallery space. Yeah. Do we, do you think we need to do more to, to change society's view of the nature of art? Yes, we do. We need to understand that, for example, a poem, you may see the poem in a particular font on a particular page, mm. but that isn't actually the poem itself. The poem is something else that sits away from that. This notion of the object isn't necessarily one that we follow throughout the arts. And so, you know, we need to question it sometimes in the visual arts. Too. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Well, all sorts of themes there around interactivity, play, distribution, time, all of which are changing the nature of art and certainly provoking lots of thoughts in, in my mind. To come back to creative technologies, which is our focus in the, the Seabay Centre, you were one of the first to explore technologies for creative uses and you've looked at the trends through your keynote. In your view, what's next in the space of creative technologies? Well, I think um, cooperative, co-creativity, cooperative creativity okay. is the thing that will drive many of the next developments. Technological mm -hmm. support for people working together mm. in a co-creative way. 
Uh, after all, I know we're used to the lonely artist in the studio, you know, <laughs> starving and all that. But if you look at other art forms, film, for example, you know, theatre, uh, people mm -hmm. work together very often. And I think we'll see more and more of that. And I think the technology that we know about in uh, social media stuff will find more and more application in supporting co-creativity. How far away do you think we are from being able to to see this achieve a breakthrough in work? I mean, we've, we've obviously over the last year, 18 months, seen an explosion of work-based technologies to enable us to collaborate, but most of it hasn't been very creative. I mean, no. there, there's some interesting breakthroughs in teaching and so on, but they're, they're not really creative technologies per se. How far away do you think we are? I don't think we're all that far away in terms of knowing how to do it, but there are social mm -hmm. and political issues that have to be overcome to enable some of this <laughs> stuff to really happen for, for, for well. But if you look at the history of technological developments in the arts, think of the visual arts, you know, the invention of oil paint, photography, mm. and so on, then you can see that there's usually quite a long time, usually more than 50 years, before it really becomes bedded in. Well, and in this stuff that we're now talking about, we have, uh, roughly speaking, 50 years behind us. So it would seem, by the normal pattern of things, that if you like, the generational change that's, that would seem to be necessary normally must be taking place now. And when I look at children and I work with children on what they're doing, they find all this stuff completely normal. And when I interviewed a lot of artists who use computers for a book I published with someone else recently, I found the big difference between the old guys, my age group, who could talk about what happened when they discovered computers, to the young guys who thought, talked about what happened when they discovered art, having already known computers from when they were like toddlers, more or less, mm. and saw computers as just a normal part of life, just like paper, pencils yeah. and everything else. It's that generational change that's happening. And those people, are, the, the digital natives, are now being the grown-ups, if you like, mm -hmm. who are beginning yeah. to drive society. So we need to give the uh, the floor to the the younger people, the, the the digital natives, as you call them. That's that's the way to make this happen, and we need to step aside. In a sense, yes, I think so. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yeah. But then maybe no, no, it's fine. I, I think <laughs> let's, let's be let's provoke and challenge and see see yeah. if we get a backlash from our the older age group of our listeners. That's fascinating. Anything else you think we need to achieve breakthrough into the mainstream? Well, I think we need to look at the education system. If we look at the school system, then I find that my own grandchildren, the kids I know best, are being more creative out of school than in it, than using technology to be creative out of school. Mm -hmm. I think that is sad. The national curriculum may not match uh, an ambition to have a more creative community. <laughs> and so these things matter a lot. And I think we should care mm -hmm. about it. Do you think universities are doing enough to support creativity? Last question on this theme. I mean, we, we see our students being extraordinarily creative in how they've resolved challenges over the last year. And um, certainly yes. many of my colleagues have been shocked and pleasantly surprised by the way they've overcome the challenges. Are universities stepping up to the plate? Not really, although, as you say, the last year has been a very positive in that respect in mm. many ways. But I think that we're constrained by measures, having targets to meet, things to achieve, mm -hmm. lists of things that have to be ticked and so on. It's something that has grown during my life in yeah. universities and led, I think, to students being less encouraged in their creative endeavours than they mm -hmm. used to be, as if we know perfectly well what they should learn and we've just got to check that they've learnt it. That isn't yeah. really a very good attitude if we're wanting to stimulate creativity. Well, hopefully the new wave of younger people coming through will challenge the existing university systems. And if we do have a, a market, I think it will. I'm optimistic. They will. Yeah. 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 I'm optimistic in that respect. No, me too. Me too. Thank you, Ernest. That was fascinating to look at those aspects of, of how creative technologies can take a hold in the, in the next five to 10 years. Coming back to our centre, uh, CBAY, our purpose is 
to build technologies that support and inspire people to be at their most creative when problem solving, collaborating and interacting every day. We call it creativity on demand. So in this regular feature, I have three questions to test your creativity on demand. The okay. first question is, what is the single most important thing you require to be creative? I'd put it like this, space to get it wrong or not make a decision. <laughs> so I need to never be forced to decide something. Lots of mm -hmm. software does. First of all, put your name in and then do something else, True. whatever. You know, I need to not decide things. I need to be able to get it wrong and go back and change my mind. That's the most important thing. Are you me. suggesting that procrastination is an important part of creativity? Absolutely, yes. Excellent. Excellent. I am. <laughs> <laughs> the second question, therefore, is if you could create any tech or app that could do anything real or imaginary, what would it be? What I would really like is to move more heavily into a sculptural world. And for that, what I would like is a programming system where I could edit holographs in real time. So I could wow. have a dynamic changing hologram changed by my code. <laughs> it's like extension of Scratch. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> great. That sounds a great one. That's the best answer we've had, I think, so far in this podcast. And I apologize to the other um, speakers. <laughs> and the third question is, if you could remove one thing from the world in order to make humans more creative, what would it be? What would you put in the bin? Okay, I've hinted at this already, I think. Tests. Okay. <laughs> there's no need to elaborate you just say test no. so that's it yeah thank you indeed for taking time to talk to us uh, we hope it's it's been interesting um thank you for inviting me it has been interesting and i i wish you well in your endeavors so what, what's up for you next is it some more artwork or some exhibitions in the pipeline yes i'm doing a piece for the uh, which I mentioned, but it's actually a piece for the British Pavilion in the Dubai Expo, mm. which is this internet based piece where it interacts locally with people in front of it. The two pieces are connected together and interact with one another. So whatever happens in Leicester, as it is in this case, influences yeah. what people see in Dubai and, vi and vice versa. Fantastic. When does that? When does that? Uh, it it's go live. The so opening is. It goes live the 1st of October. Okay, well, it's should, actually should Dubai 2020, <laughs> which didn't happen. <laughs> they still seem to be calling it Dubai 2020, uh, you know, yeah. Dubai Expo 2020. But yeah, like everything else. Fantastic. And if our listeners want to find out more about your work, where's the best place to go? Well, I guess my website is probably a quick thing, and I've got links on there to other places. Okay, that so, sounds good. Which is so, just ernestedmonds.com. That's what I was going to say, www.ernestedmonds.com. That's the key yeah. place to go for information. Yeah, I so, think so. Thank you again, Ernest. Uh, thank you for listening to the Seabay podcast, a regular series of conversations to shed light on issues of creativity and how technology can enable more effective ways for humans to be creative. Please take time to like the podcast and leave a review. It really does make a difference. You can also follow us on Twitter at CBay or on LinkedIn, Creativity Enabled by AI, or drop us an email at cbay at city.ac.uk. Mm -hmm.